Forget the speed, forget the fans, forget money and adoration. Indy is about immortality. It's a race that's so famous it lends its name to the series that runs it. It draws the world's best, all seeking a taste of the greatest spectacle in racing. For Hoosiers, it's an identity, and it owes it all to one unyielding believer in the American dream. Born to an unremarkable family in Greensburg, Indiana, Carl Fisher was an unremarkable boy. Crippled by severe astigmatism, Fisher struggled through school and by all accounts was destined to amount to little more than his alcoholic father. When his mother filed for divorce and moved the family to Indianapolis, though, the course of his life dramatically shifted. The oldest of three brothers, Fisher, still just 12 years old, became the man of the house and was determined to rise to the challenge. Fully cognizant of his shortcomings as a student, he left school and took a job at the local grocer, unbeknownst to his mother, returning with a full bag of groceries and declaring himself to be the new provider. Over the next half decade, Fisher worked hawking small goods to rail riders, as a clerk in a bookstore, even in a bank. Feeling he had learned more from those jobs than most do in a lifetime, in 1891, still only 17 years old, Fisher opened his first business, a small bicycle shop near the brand new Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Indianapolis. Buoyed by the recent invention of the safety bike, a replacement for the big-wheeled penny farthing, and the inflatable rubber tire, the bicycle industry was booming in the 1890s. Fisher, along with his two brothers, went to great lengths to ensure that boom went to their pockets. A salesman through and through, Fisher proved his bikes in races, competing across the Midwest with friend Barney Oldfield, and performed outrageous stunts to bring eyes to his business. Once, he released a thousand balloons, 50 of which contained a free bike certificate, creating a stir so large that the mayor of Indianapolis personally asked to present the winners with their bikes. So large was his celebrity that the League of American Wheelmen, a cycling lobbying group responsible for the development of America's first paved roads, made his shop their regional hub. To bring the highly lucrative wheelmen's meet, the League Cycling Expo and Race Weekend to Indianapolis, Fisher needed to build somewhere for it to happen. Unable to supply the large capital outlay himself, he set out in search of backers, quickly finding a willing match in fellow Zigzag Bicycling Club member Arthur Newby. Newby, who was hugely wealthy from the Indianapolis Chain and Stamping Company, who manufactured nearly 60% of the country's bicycle chains, knew that centralizing competitive cycling in Indiana could serve to enrich him through his company and through the track. A man always after a deal, Newby supplied $23,000, and in 1898, the Newby Oval opened. With high banked corners and a pine surface engineered for speed, the Oval was one of the fastest bike tracks in the country drawing all the best racers and the league's 1898 meet, just as Fisher had envisioned. The success quickly faded, though. Hampered by rail tycoons gouging wheelmen traveling long distances into the country's heartland, attendance at the 1898 meet fell wildly short of expectations. This was an omen of things to come. Interest in bicycle racing and cycling at large was quickly waning. The Oval struggled to fill its seats, turning to track and field, football, even vaudeville in a desperate and ultimately futile attempt to turn things around. By 1903, the track was being disassembled and sold for parts, but Fisher had already found a new obsession and deftly avoided the fall. Spending a decade at the forefront of the cycling industry, Fisher was always abreast of the developing trends, and at the turn of the century, he found one that again would change his life. Through the 1880s and 90s, De Dion Bouton, a French engineering firm, had been hard at work developing a motorized tricycle. Though their steam trikes had been little more than playthings for the European aristocracy, an 1895 combustion engine breakthrough by engineer Georges Bouton made it possible to bring a viable product to the market, and in 1897, they did just that. The De Dion Bouton cycle car was so successful in Europe that soon it made its way stateside, and Fisher just had to have one. Together with racing buddy Barney Oldfield, he traveled to New York for America's first auto show in 1900 and, still a salesman, set out to prove its efficacy by driving all two and a half horsepower back to Indianapolis, a journey over 750 miles and one of the first of its kind. Said by some to be the first automobile in all of Indiana, Fisher's trike became the envy and bane of his neighbors, and with Oldfield's help, the once bustling bike shop was outfitted to sell motor cars. Now with skin in the game, Fisher and Oldfield set off around the Midwest, staging races and promoting the limitless potential of the automobile. Oldfield developed a reputation as one of the fastest men alive, 
1903, he piloted Henry Ford's 999 racer to the first ever sub one minute mile at the Indiana Fairgrounds. Two years later, he even won the American Automobile Association's first ever national motor car championship, beating out Fiat's Louis Chevrolet for the title. Fisher, on the other hand, had only seen modest success. He won the occasional race in 1903 and 4, even garnering plaudits for his driving ability from Horseless Age magazine, but it was evident that his future lay off the track. Despite his passion for racing, Fisher's entrepreneurial spirit trumped all, ready to call him back home at a moment's notice. And when Percy Avery walked into his shop, that call came. Avery, a buoy light inventor, had spent years workshopping a way to safely install his acetylene lights into cars, trains, and anything else with wheels. It almost seemed a hopeless task. The gas was implicated in more explosions than anyone could count, but Avery somehow made it work. Believing it too good to be true, Fisher called upon his friend James Allison, a coupon book heir, and often the balancing force to Fisher's impulsiveness, who according to legend threw the light off the West Washington Street Bridge to test Percy's claim. Satisfied when no fireball erupted from the rocks below, the three men formed the Concentrated Acetylene Company and began producing Percy's newly named Prestolite products almost immediately. Prestolite made them rich beyond belief. In a matter of years, nearly every car, motorcycle, or bike that could be fitted with headlights was fitted with Prestolite lamps. Factories sprouted around the country, expanding the men's influence at a rate they could have never conceived. The once well-to-do Midwestern entrepreneurs were now genuine men of means, tycoons of the industrial age, allowing Fisher to pursue his passions unfettered by the pursuit of money or status. America, France, England, Fisher traveled the Western world studying the latest innovations in automotive technology, addicted to always being one step ahead of the market. He would quickly come to find, however, that he had until then merely been addicted to staying one step ahead of the domestic market. The cars he saw on his European tour far outclassed their American counterparts. Benz, Bouton, Daimler, Maybach, Europe's great forward thinkers spared no expense in the hunt for perfection, and the results were truly staggering. While American manufacturers were intent on producing the economical horseless carriage, more reminiscent of Santa's sleigh than a high-performance machine, Daimler's Mercedes was writing the book on what a car should be. Developed on the racetracks of southern France before being converted into a road-goer so popular that DMG hit the absolute limit of their production capacity, the Mercedes 35 horsepower was a loud coming-out party. Featuring a long wheelbase for handling, a low center of gravity for stability, a modern steel chassis and bodywork, it became the seed from which every car since, from every manufacturer, has sprouted. Maybach and Daimler further honed the 35 horsepower into 40 and 60 horsepower models, dubbing their new creation the Simplex and enrapturing the European aristocracy and racing enthusiasts alike. Fast and luxurious, practical and powerful, it was otherworldly, and Fisher was desperate to bring the level of innovation that had birthed it back to his burgeoning auto capital in Indiana. Though he could not replace the years-long head start Carl Benz's revolutionary motor car had given to the Europeans, Fisher did have a plan to close the gap. After time, he figured, the biggest disadvantage to American auto domination wasn't capability, but suitability. Races in the United States were typically run on horse tracks, posing great danger to the spectators, or public roads so derelict that the first administrator of what is now the Federal Highway Administration deemed this the only civilized country in the world without good roads. Races in France, meanwhile, were run on roads described in a comprehensive 600-page State Department report as the very best in the world. Powerless to redefine infrastructure in a country so vast, Fisher set out to replace the horse track envisioning a five-mile ring, 40 yards wide, purpose-built for pushing cars to their absolute extremes. Spurred on by the opening of England's Brooklyn's race circuit, a near match of what he had dreamt for Indianapolis, Fisher doubled down, resolving to break ground if it was the last thing he did. Together with business partner James Allison, cycling friend Arthur Newby, and carburetor manufacturer Frank Wheeler, Fisher purchased the Presley Farm and thus was born Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Sort of. Fisher's original vision for what the track would become quickly unraveled. A five-mile oval, it turned out, required significantly more space than he had budgeted for, far exceeding the boundaries of their newly purchased property. Plan B, a three-mile oval with a two-mile road course in the infield, was also beyond their means, pushing the property to its absolute limit and impeding the construction of grandstands. 
two and a half miles with a matching road course, it was determined, was the most they could possibly squeeze within the boundary of the old farm. Begrudgingly then, work began late in March of 1909 with plans to open on July 4th of the same year. Unencumbered by modern construction standards, their aggressive target, while improbable, was certainly within the realm of possibility. But try as they might, the geography of the site once again let them down. Little Eagle Creek, whose main path splits the property well to the east of the planned track site, had a tributary, Dry Run Creek, that proved to be totally unavoidable. Immediately, the timeline for the project changed. All events, save a hot air balloon exhibition that didn't need the track anyway, were pushed back to August. Constructing the track over the creek proved to be a monumental undertaking, but the team answered the bell again. Under the direction of project manager P.T. Andrews, tunnels were laid under turn one and the front stretch, allowing for the free flow of dry run and resumption of the track's schedule. For Fisher, every pound of earth moved and every nail struck was excruciating. Not only had he sunk a huge deal of money into this track, $2.5 million adjusted for inflation, he had also been working towards getting his pilot's license to fly a very expensive balloon in their maiden event. Board by board, the buildings rose higher, Fisher's army working with remarkable speed, and somehow the facility was presentable by race day on June 6th. That's not to say anything was finished. The track itself was still being graded, and only about half of the planned 12,000 seats had been erected. But it was in a state where the investors could begin to recoup their quarter-million-dollar outlay. 3,500 spectators passed through the gates for the national balloon race, a figure far dwarfed by the 40,000 onlookers who watched from the roads outside and made entry to the track all but impossible. The sea of spectators ran so deep that even the governor of Indiana, the race's guest of honor, arrived only in time for the final three ascensions. Traffic control aside, it was a phenomenal success. Journalists ate it alive. Fisher himself was involved in a dramatic controversy. Crazy farmers tried to shoot them all from the sky. And every paper, even the New York Times, made mention of the new speedway. That the times and distances were far less than expected was immaterial. Fisher, it seemed, had created a goose that laid golden eggs, and the race was on to finish the driving surface in time for the arrival of the Federation of American Motorcyclists in August. Unlike Brooklyn's, which had the financial backing of minor aristocrat Hugh Locke King, IMS couldn't justify paving with concrete. Though highly suitable for racing, so much so that it's still used on tracks today, concrete was simply far too prone to decay. The group instead settled on a blend of gravel, limestone, rock, and liquid coal tar, all packed down into one cohesive layer, hopeful that it could provide enough tack and stability to set record-breaking times. Up to the very last days, man and machine worked around the clock, pouring and packing right down to the wire, but again, the men managed to beat the buzzer. Beginning on August 8th, bikers flocked to Indianapolis by the hundreds. The FAM meet, not unlike the Wheelman's meet, which Newby and Fisher had previously lured to the city, was as much an event as it was a race. All of the most prominent motorcycle brands, riders, and owners took over the city. American motorcycles had never been pushed to the limits that the long straights and high bank corners would theoretically allow, and enthusiasts were chomping at the bit to see them run on the absolute brink. Finally, through all the struggle and doubt, Fisher's vision for IMS was coming to fruition. When rubber met the road, though, Fisher again found the moment of triumph fleeting. The speedway and motorcycles were horribly incompatible. It was unlike anything on which they had ever run. Compared to the standard hardwood or packed dirt, racers found the surface much less stable, tending to loosen and give way beneath even the lightest bikes. Not only that, the unusually rough terrain shoved them around. Lacking modern tires and suspensions, the riders found themselves frequently at the track's mercy, always to their detriment. A mutiny formed within the FAM's ranks after the practice sessions on Thursday, with some desiring to move the races to the Indiana fairgrounds and some in favor of abandoning them altogether. In the end, FAM President Earl Ovington, under the advisement of Fisher, opted to continue the events as scheduled. Not discouraged by the discord or a Friday rainout, 8,500 fans turned up for IMS's grand reveal, ready for the show to end all shows. They too would find jubilation temporary. Just seven men turned up for the first race. Further chaos ensued when, after the second event, U.S. amateur champion Stanley Kellogg refused to continue very publicly making known his dissatisfaction with track conditions. 
Following a horrific crash in the Pro 10 mile and 42 withdrawals from the amateur running, Ovington mercifully called a stop to the meet. Fisher loudly contested the decision, attacking the moral fiber and fortitude of the bikers, but it was clear the meet was an unmitigated disaster, and now everything hinged on the auto races the following week. The next Thursday, around 15,000 strong, the people of Indiana made it known that they still believed, coming alive in full voice for their heroes behind the wheel. The surface, however, had again shown issues that seriously threatened the viability of racing. Drivers caked in coal tar, deep grooves cut in the corners barely a half day into racing. The safety issues were on full display. But, unlike the weekend before, the cars were beyond fast. Barney Oldfield smashed a four-year-old track record for one mile. Louis Chevrolet broke Oldfield's five-year-old track record for ten miles. Seeing the records fall, the crowd was whipped into a frenzy, and there was still one big race left to make a run at them all, the 250-mile Prestolite Trophy. Taking the flag at 1.30, the star-studded race got off to a flying start. Chevrolet came to the 100-mile mark six minutes faster than the existing record, obliterating the time set by his Buick teammate Bob Berman. IMS was beginning to show that it wasn't just conducive to speed, it demanded it. As before, though, that speed came at a steep price. By the halfway point, the surface was practically disintegrating beneath the force of the cars. Loose stones took out the race leader, shattering Chevrolet's goggles and leaving him blinded by the dust and tar kicked into the air, but worse yet laid around the corner. After checking his shoulder for the pack, Billy Bourquet and his number three Knox drifted high towards the wall, getting caught in a rut, causing him to lose control as he drifted even higher, over the edge of the track and into a fence, reportedly at speeds around 80 miles per hour. Both Bourquet and his mechanic Harry Holcomb died of their injuries. Despite the race finishing without further incident, there was again consideration for canceling the weekend schedule, but Fisher, against all odds, managed to convince the organizers that with repairs to the track, they could continue as planned. Remarkably, day two was uneventful. 22,000 turned up to see even more records fall. Local hero Johnny Aitken broke the five-mile record. Len Zangle broke Chevrolet's 10-mile record from the day before, and in the main event, Lewis Strang went nearly wire-to-wire -wire for the G&J Trophy, smashing all records between 20 and 100 miles. The surface adjustments made by IMS and AAA had mitigated the track's dangers, at least for now. Filled with confidence, everyone returned to the Speedway for a big day three, an unprecedented 35,000 packed in like sardines to witness Fisher's spectacle in all its glory. Aitken, the hometown boy, flexed his muscle early, leading the first hundred miles, but quickly the mood shifted. It was clear to all that the surface was no longer in a safe condition. Like the first day, deep ruts were forming and tar-laden dust was swirling. Drivers retired from the race at an alarming pace. Half the field had returned to the garage by mile 150. The longer they ran, the more they were begging for something bad to happen. And sure enough, they got their wish. On lap 70, Charlie Merz's number 10 national blew a tire, careening to the right, through the fence, and squarely into a group of fans. Merz's mechanic, Claude Kellum, and two spectators died in the crash. Ten laps later, another racer, Bruce Keane, lost control on the front stretch, smashing into a fence post and ejecting his mechanic, who miraculously survived. Pushed over their breaking point, the AAA officials, after a very brief discussion, called an end to the race on lap 94 but the damage had been done. AAA gave an ultimatum to Fisher and his investors. Find a way to fix the surface or we'll never come back. Left at the drawing board, the four men, committed to keeping the track open, began to craft a solution. Not wanting to waste another dollar of the substantial investment they had made, the group brought in every potential paver they could imagine and put them through their paces, looking for the best combination of durability, grip, and price. After several weeks, the men found that brick was their Goldilocks surface, and work immediately began installing them onto the racetrack. Over the course of two months, workers laid 32 million pounds of local Indiana brick, driven nearly to madness by Fisher's timetable. Every construction project he touched seemed unthinkable, impossible even, but again the men delivered. Newly dubbed the Brickyard, IMS was back in action. Officials, racers, and fans alike were so pleased with the new track that three of AAA's six sanctioned race weekends in 1910 were scheduled to be contested at Indianapolis, including its first Memorial Day showpiece. 
That year, nearly every track record, many of which had been stolen by the new Atlanta Speedway, fell. Cars ran over 100 miles per hour, and most importantly, casualties weren't piling up. Galvanized by its now proven excellence, Indianapolis made the Speedway a part of their cultural fabric. Over 100,000 pilgrims came to worship at the altar of Fisher's Automotive Palace, with thousands more seeing his rotating calendar of events, including a Wright Brothers flying exhibition, at which Walter Brookins twice broke the human altitude record. The bricks in the track were at last paying for themselves, but cracks in the foundation inevitably formed. By September, IMS's third major weekend of the year, interest waned in the product on offer. Largely, these were the same drivers running the same machines over the same distances and for the same rewards. Only 18,000, a paltry figure at $1 each, saw Johnny Aitken cross the line of the final 200-mile race. Fisher knew that if this was going to be the great sporting wonder he planned, they needed to quickly remedy the oversaturation at their track. Like the Vanderbilt Cup in New York or the defunct Gordon Bennett Cup in France, he wanted to move towards being a high-stakes one-off race attracting all the best in the world to run at Indianapolis. With enough pomp and circumstance, he reasoned, they could bring in the full 100000 for one big weekend. Always the promoter, Fisher sought to give the race a gaudy, headline-making format. 24 hours of Indianapolis. The Indianapolis 1000. They shot for the moon. But, constrained by consumer interest and the practicality of lighting a stadium two decades before baseball would, he settled on a more modest, but still unprecedented, 500 miles. Scheduled for Memorial Day weekend 1911, as it had been their most profitable date the year before, the International 500-Mile Sweepstakes, informally called the Indianapolis 500, was famous from the off. News of the $27,550 purse, the largest ever offered for a race, spread like wildfire across the world. Even at $500 a car, 46 entries were sent in, the age-old lore of gold and glory proving yet again irresistible. On May 1st, the team started to flow into Indianapolis, taking advantage, to varying degrees, of the month-long guarantee of open practice sessions, a practice that still survives today as the month of May. By race week, 44 cars arrived, 40 of which met the minimum qualifying standard, and the field was set for the first running of the Indianapolis 500. Lining up alongside Fisher Stoddard Dayton in what is believed to be the first use of a pace car, the 40 men rounded IMS, waiting for the red flag to fall. 80,000 fans joined in Fisher's Great Hoosier Symphony as the engines roared to life on lap one, a scene unlike any other in the history of the sport. Befitting the occasion, the first 25 laps were pure chaos. Intense battling for the lead saw six men make it to the front of the pack, while trouble further back saw the 500 claim its first victim, a mechanic named Sam Dixon. It was a harsh reminder of the realities of racing before safety requirements, but that was the nature of the beast, so the show went on. An early period of dominance from David Bruce Brown aside, the race settled into a two-man affair between Ralph Mulford and Ray Haroon, a seven-time race winner at IMS. Though Mulford had Haroon dead to rights for pace, the wily vet had a new trick up his sleeve, the world's first rearview mirror. Developed specifically for this race, which he had come out of retirement to run, the mirror eliminated the need for a race engineer, allowing Haroon to drive a much more aerodynamically efficient single-seater. He needed every second it bought him, too. Mulford took the contest down to the wire, finishing just 1 minute and 43 seconds behind Haroon in a race which lasted nearly 7 hours. Only in Fisher's dreams could he have had a more perfect inaugural champion. Against Benzes and Mercedes and Fiat's, Haroon took the checkered in a car from Indianapolis' own Marmon, vindicating his belief that the track would stimulate local manufacturers, not just provide sport. Having succeeded in making the track profitable and fulfilling its mission in the community, Fisher gradually became less involved as his business interests took him elsewhere. Though he still had his estate in Indianapolis and enjoyed taking the pace car for a drive, the desperation that drove him over the past decade had faded. In 1912, he began buying up land in Miami Beach, which his teenage wife, Jane, fell in love with shortly after their marriage in 1909. Fisher dreamt of turning the swampy, overgrown island off Miami's coast into a winter playground for the rich, printing himself a pretty penny in the process. To that end, he and Allison sold out of Prestolite for $4.5 million each, roughly $144 million adjusted for inflation. Fisher was instrumental in constructing both the Lincoln Highway, the first road to connect America's coasts, and the Dixie Highway, which connected the Midwest to his little island home. Though Miami Beach was a money pit, Fisher continued to press the issue, 
advertising and pulling stunts to create an exotic reputation among the East's highbrow crowd. The most successful of these, which turned the fortunes of Miami Beach for good, was a 1921 photo op of President-elect Warren G. Harding and his elephant Rosie. Population boomed, real estate values soared, and Fisher's fortune ballooned to an estimated $100 million, equivalent to $1.7 billion in 2024. Miami Beach made him so wealthy that in 1926, he bought 10,000 acres in Montauk, New York, with the idea of creating a temperate summer resort town to complement South Florida's tropical winter appeal. Before he could get stuck in, he and Jane filed for divorce, and his world quickly came crumbling down. In newspapers and government offices, Florida's real estate boom was coming under serious scrutiny. Developers, Fisher included, were building at a pace far exceeding real, non-speculative demand. It became so bad that Florida's three major rail companies started to embargo shipments of building materials to the Miami area. Bad only turned to worse in September when the Great Miami Hurricane made landfall and caused flooding up to six feet, knocked down buildings, and totaled over $100 million in damage. Fisher was ruined. He had overextended himself to build Montauk, counting on the revenues from Miami Beach to finish his work. However, with Miami Beach being little more than rubble, he was doomed to insolvency. He and Allison, the last surviving members of the Speedway's original ownership group, sold their interests to try and get him through the storm, to no avail. When the Depression hit, he finally threw in the towel. He sold his Miami Beach Manor and took a salary job, trying to get back onto his feet, but it was no use. He no longer had a passion for life. On July 15, 1939, age 65, Fisher, who had lived 10 lives in one, died from complications of alcoholism. He was hailed a local hero in the Miami Daily News, the visionary behind Miami Beach. But his Hoosier heart, and eventually his body, lie in Indiana, his land of dreams.